Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Common Council meeting, City of Marshfield, Tuesday, May 9th, 207 West 6th Street. Please uh, call roll. All present, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're going to open the letter C with a public hearing. Special Assessment Project 312297, Mill in Place and Asphalt Overlay Projects. Number one, Anton Avenue, 5th Street to 4th Street. I can just read them all the way down. Number two, Becker Road, Maple Avenue to Daigie Street. Number three, Edison Street, Cedar Avenue to Becker Road. Number four, Lincoln Avenue, 14th Street to one half mile north near Pet Motel. Number five, Vine Avenue, Becker Road to Edison Street. Number six, Fifth Street, Hume Avenue to Anton Avenue. Number seven, Eighth Street, Peach Avenue to Felker Avenue. Number eight, St. Joseph's Avenue, Arnold Street to Asphalt North 1970LF. Number nine, Lamy Avenue, 21st Street to 5th Street. Number 10, Northridge Street, Thomas Drive to Central Avenue. And number 11, 5th Street, Anton Avenue to Lamy Avenue. The public hearing is now open. Anybody wish to make comments on any of these streets? Any wish to make comments on any of these streets? Anybody wish to make any comments on these streets? The public hearing is now closed. Item D, the second public hearing. Special Assessment Project 312344 Street Construction, Water Service Laterals, Storm Sewer and Project 351755 Sanitary Sewer Service Laterals, Arnold Street, St. Joseph's Avenue to 700 West. The public hearing is now open. Anybody like to make comments? Any comments on the hearing? Any comments on the hearing? Seeing none, that hearing is also closed. And our third and final public hearing of the evening, Special Assessment Project 351756, Sanitary Sewer Construction Projects. Number one, Cherry Avenue, 2nd Street to 1st Street. Second, Chestnut Avenue, Depot Street to Blodgett Street. Number three, Depot Street, Chestnut Avenue to Central Avenue. Number four, Palmetto Avenue, Daigie Street to Becker Road. Number five, 8th Street, Felker Avenue to 175 feet west of Felker Avenue. This public hearing is now open. Anybody wish to make any comments? Anybody would like to make any comments during this public hearing? Anyone wish to make any comments during public hearing? Seeing none, the third and final public hearing is closed. And I'm actually glad this happened this evening so some of you folks know what the city is doing to make our streets better, correct? Yes. So next time you see a worker, give them one of this, everybody. Well, you don't have to, that's just because I'm the mayor, I didn't mean to say that, but it makes them feel good because they're doing great things for us in Marshfield. Number F, identify possible conflicts of interest. Seeing none, we will move on to item G. Public comment period correspondence. At this time, I will recognize those members of the public who have indicated a desire to address the council. Upon recognition by me, persons may address the council first, stating their name and address. The council may act on emergency matters introduced by members of the public. Our first speaker this evening will be Raymond LeBlanc. And Raymond, you have five minutes once you get to the podium. Yes, sir. If you'd put your, the microphone, there's a little button to push on. Thank you. Now it's working. Okay, yes, thank sir. you. Yeah, I just want to give Mike a few minutes to pass these out to all the city council members and mayor. Uh, my name is Raymond LeBlanc. Uh, I'm a minister at uh, 
remnant church here in town in 252 Central. Um, there's a, a, a major turnout here, it looks like, tonight, more than unusual. Uh, this is a very compassionate issue that we're dealing with, and um, there's people representing both sides. Um, we are not against um, or hating against any of these people that have showed up that are supporting the gay rights. And, and what, what I want to do as soon as Mike is done is um, uh, just present a little video, uh, an audio tape that I made. It's only a minute long. Is my time already started? Yes, yeah. it is. You have four minutes okay. and 10 seconds. Um, people out here, this here is what I just passed out to all the council meetings. It's a drag queen. Uh, and in his own words, he records this statement that I like to read. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd like to play. Hold on a minute, I'll get it. Yeah. Why you want drag queens to read books to your children. What in the hell has a drag queen ever done to make you have so much respect for them and admire them so much? Other than put on makeup and, and jump on the floor and ride around and do sexual things on stage. I have absolutely no idea why you would want that to influence your child. Would you want a stripper or a porn star to influence your child? It, it makes no sense at all. A drag queen performs in a nightclub for adults. There is a lot of filth that goes on, a lot of sexual stuff that goes on. And backstage, there's a lot of nudity, sex and drugs. So I don't think that this is a, a, an avenue you would want your child to explore. To actually get them involved in drag is extremely, extremely irresponsible on your part. And I understand you might want to look like you're with it, that you're cool, that you're woke, that you're not a Nazi, that you're not a homophobe, whatever, whatever it may be. But you can raise your child to be just a normal, regular, everyday child without including them in gay, sexual thing. Hey man, that's from a drag queen to another drag queen that's pretty well known in the gay community. Um, no. uh, but anyways, I sent out a flyer uh, to a lot of the people in town, to the churches, and this is what's drawn the attention that you're receiving right now, um, is our opposition to drag queens in our Central Park here in Windsor, like they did last year. Very provocative. These are children. You just heard from the words of a drag queen himself that this is adult entertainment. Our plea is to move this out of town. This is right in the heart of the city. There's a, a, a park out out of the town in, I think it's called Northwood, somewhere out there a couple of miles away. Please consider having it relocated. People are all over the city walking these streets and they're being more and more aggressive and in, in showing uh, this kind of uh, behavior. And uh, we don't think it's appropriate, that's why we're here, to uh, inform you people that uh, we, we'd like to see you make a, a, a decision to, to stop this dry queen from happening June 24th uh, in the Wenzel Park. The Wenzel people, I've talked to some of the Wenzels, um, they're very upset that their name is being dragged through this as well. Some of them are in their elderly ages and they can't make it here. But I just want to close in prayer over over this body of believers, like when we pledged allegiance to the flag, it said, we're one nation under God, we're all under God's authority. And he's the one that laid down the moral code that we are lacking severely. He explained to us what sex was for between a man and a woman in holy matrimony and has been thrown out. And, and the hatred of God is, is growing. Uh, he created every single one of your beautiful faces out here. You know, and he's got a purpose for everybody's life. And he just wants the best for you. He warns us of disasters. He warns us of, of how to live a proper life. He gives us guidelines. And if we follow these guidelines, uh, we do well. 
Uh, so, Lord, I just pray over this body of city councils because they're up against a lot of pressure, and I pray for wisdom over their, over them, Lord God, and courage and boldness to stand up uh, for for moral, uh, be a moral compass to our community. Uh, we need it so bad; it's just thank slipping you, away from us. Am thank I you, my time up? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes, and thank you. Okay. Our second, Teresa Kanapa. Good evening. My, I'm Teresa Kanapa. Uh, living at 1501 South Cherry Avenue. We the people stand for God, country, Marshfield, and families. With that in mind, we pray. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, Trust into hell, Satan, and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Now, you claim to be a mayor for everybody. Not so. For us fellow Catholics, you go against the church teachings. You're either with God or against him. And here are some examples. Okay. Painting stripes on a cow doesn't make it a zebra. Just like putting makeup and a dress on a man doesn't make him a woman. Here's a beverage pretending to be beer, features men pretending to be a woman. Here's a girl. She says, so I can't pick my bedtime, but I can pick my gender. Hmm. Interesting. Now, have our biological sex, the sex organs that we're born with, are not connected to gender, then why is it necessary to remove them in order to express your gender in whatever you want? Go figure. Why is it that when archaeologists find human remains, they always determine that they are either from a male or a female, and none of the other 7,000 genders. There are only two genders. Amen. You see Wonder Woman? Okay, my generation had Wonder Woman. Your generation has Wonder if it's a woman. Here's Rambo. If Rambo aired in 2023, he would become Trambo. Now on the lighter side, this is for the road people. Okay. Just paid my taxes. Roads should be fixed any day now, especially East 14th Street. Please, thank you. Now, the last but not least is the most unsuccessful lockdown of all time. Jesus Christ is risen. He is alive. And even though we are sinful right, right now, we can come back to him, repent, and be saved. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. 
Dorothy Schnitzler. Is this for short people? Uh -huh, thank you. Yes. Okay, hel oh, hello everyone. My name is Dorothy. I live in Marshville. First of all, a bit. Excuse me, your address, please. Oh, 709. Seven, Dorothy Schnitzler. That's not hard, easy to say. 709 South Cherry Avenue. Okay. First of all, just a bit of history to share. My parents went through hard times. My father wanted to raise his family on a farm. He wanted to move from the city to a farm. At that point, I was six years old. Running a farm taught my brothers and I hard work and working together. I think the kids in the city have a hard time sometimes and can get into trouble. The schools have not always had a, a did a good job. Sometimes unhappy and confused kids. With that being said, I was just wondering about why the drag queen shows during the month of June in celebration of the LG, I'm not sure of all the other letters. I wonder why this show is now considered family friendly. I think there are shows for adults in bigger cities nightly where the drag queens put on a show for 21 year old and older. I wonder why a man wants to dress like a woman. Please do your thing in these night shows. Please do not consider your show a family-friendly show. Have you taken monetary tips from children? If so, why do you take it? Free speech is still a right in our country, as far as I know. That's why we are here tonight. The rainbow, as far as I know, was a promise to Noah. You know, the man in the ark with all the animals. The God of the Bible promised not another flood would happen, but in the end times I read, it will end in fire, as it did in the cities of Sodom and, and that other city. And this is written in the Bible. And it is a little scary. Check it out. When Jesus died on the cross, his words were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And your choice does matter. Jesus paid the price for our sins. Uh, the word acquiesce, acquiesce means if you say nothing, you are in agreement. So thank you all. Thank you all, all, for this opportunity to speak in this public forum. Thank you. Mike, Phil. Oh, get up. I get it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council members, for this opportunity. I just wanted to say that those here with a different opinion or outlook, we do not dislike you, okay? We don't dislike you. Okay, but if, if it goes on again at the park or wherever. Pardon me, Bill, is your mic on? Could you push the button? It's on. Oh, I, okay. oh, your name and address. I'm just kind of told. I apologize. Your name and address. Okay. It goes on again. We will be there. We will come in bigger numbers. Mike. Yes. Pardon me. Your name and address. Oh, okay. Mike Phil, 507 West 7th. And your, your name? Mike Phil. Thank you. Okay. Everybody can see me usually. But we're not going to stand by idly and watch God's law be ignored and degraded. And that's what that is what's happening here. And 
It's not good. It's put in front of the public to begin with, but especially in front of children in regards to the drag queen, drag queen thing and have their minds say twisted like that. Their minds are like sponges and their minds are being would be twisted when they watch this stuff. Mm -hmm. Then it could be done. This could be done in a, like a private building or someplace like that or outside the city limits, but not in a public park in front of the public in front of children like that. That's what that's what we're trying to say. Okay. And uh, I'd just like to, to leave you, I won't be long. Um, Jesus had some, some tough things to say about those who would offend children. And I'd urge you all to go to the Bible and find out what they were, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Sternich. <coughs> Members of the council, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Steinert. I live at 873 West 17th Street, and I have been a Marshfield resident for about 30 years now. Uh, I would like to address some of the concerns some members of our community have uh, expressed about the upcoming Pride event. I understand that there are those that believe that this event is a threat to our community, particularly our children, but I would like to offer a different perspective. First, I'd like to draw your attention to a passage from the book of Galatians, Chapter 3, verse 28, which reads, Neither Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free, nor male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. This passage emphasizes unity and equality with all people, regardless of any labels that we decide to put on them or they decide to put on themselves. If we remind, it reminds us that in the eyes of God, we are truly valued and loved equally. If we truly believe this message, then we must reject the idea that the members of the LGBTQ plus community are a threat somehow to our culture or inferior in any way. Additionally, I'd like to point out a verse from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 5 through 6, which reads, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand in synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This passage highlights the danger of performing religious acts to gain public approval or to exert some control over others. Jesus is reminding his followers that the true, uh, true religious devotion is a matter of the heart and that public displays of religiosity can be a form of hypocrisy when they are not motivated by genuine love. So uh, what does this have to do with the Pride event? Well, I believe some of the opposition of this event, uh, uh, some of the opposition is rooted in fear and misinformation rather than a genuine concern for the well-being of our community. We must remember that all people regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity, are created equal and deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. Throughout history, marginalized groups have fought for acceptance and equal treatment. We have seen this in the struggle for civil rights, women's rights, and even religious freedom. We must remember that the fight for, uh, the fight for acceptance and equality is not a new one, and that the members of the LGBTQ plus community are just the latest group to demand their rights and dignity. It's unfortunate that we still have to fight for acceptance of marginalized groups in our society. We have seen time and time again that discrimination and hatred only lead to more pain and suffering. How many times must we repeat this cycle until we learn to accept each other regardless of what our differences are? Instead of focusing on our differences, let us celebrate our common humanity. Let us recognize that each of us has an inherent worth and dignity and that all members of our community deserve to be treated with respect and kindness and should be made to feel welcome. In conclusion, I urge you to set aside any preconceived notions you may have about the LGBTQ plus community and instead approach this event with an open mind and a spirit of love and acceptance. Let us reject the notion that accepting members of the LGBTQ plus community is a symptom of something wrong with our society. Instead, let us embrace the message of unity and equality that is central to the Christian faith. Thank you.
Thank you, Andrew. Next, Dave Lemley. Hello, my name is Dave Lemley. I live at 1600 Sawyer Drive here in Marshfield. And <clears throat> not that this should matter, but I just wanna preface everything with, I'm a straight male that was raised Southern Baptist. So I hear all of this confusion going on, all of this hatred back and forth. Hatred might not be the right word. Um, confusion. I, you know, I'm just going to throw out there in Proverbs 10, 12, it said, hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. So I know the, the big issue is people aren't wanting to have a drag show in the middle of town. Six years ago, I thought like those people. Then I embraced change, growth. I met some drag queens. They are some of the best people I've ever met in my life. Chosen family not given family. Um, I'm kind of going off my notes here, but I'm speaking from the heart. Um, the, the things that people think happen at drag shows, go to one. I encourage you to go to one. Have an open mind. They don't happen like you see them on the news. The news goes for ratings. They don't they don't always put out the truth on both sides. Uh, and, and half the people who are fighting against drag queens and having drag shows and the LGBTQ community, if they look deep, they have someone in their family that's in the community. They just don't know it. Or they do and they don't want to accept it. Either way, all I'm saying, we should all be equal. We should all fight for everyone. That's what we're here for. I mean, instead, instead of making the world as confusing and, and, and hatred as it is now, let's all embrace growth. Hey, you ever thrown a pebble in the lake? You know, the little ripples that come out from the side? Every little piece of growth we have, we ripple to the next person. So if we ripple to the next person, eventually everybody is, there, there's not so much hate. There's not so much confusion in the world. And, and like I said, I, I know a lot of people in the community. If I still had young kids, they're welcome to watch my kids at any day. They, they just want, everybody in the community just wants to be loved. They should, they should feel safe at work or in the community. They just want to be loved and happy, just like everyone else. That's, that's what everyone wants. Um, the last thing I'm going to say is, remember, well, a couple things. I'm sorry, I'm gonna back up. If we're gonna if we're gonna target and say, let's move the drag show out of town, then let's move the porn store out of town. Um, the the only the only other thing I want to say is, we've got young kids now, and I heard it a minute ago from someone. They are sponges. So why are we showing them hate and, 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 and force of, you know, confusion? Maybe not hate, maybe that night. But, but let's, let's, why are we showing them to attack other people? Why don't we show them love and compassion? We don't want to raise them in a world of bigotry. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dave. Next, Nina Snodgrass. Where's the button thingy? It's right at the top. Oh, hello. I'm Nina Snodgrass, 216 North First Ave. My son is trans, came out three years ago. He's never seen a drag show in his life up until I decided to say, you know what, it's time to accept my child. It took a lot for me to accept it. I didn't understand it until my child had the encouragement to help me understand being trans. He did not feel comfortable in his own skin. He says, mom, I just don't feel like I am who I need to be. 
And that wasn't encouraged by social media. It wasn't encouraged by a drag queen because my child's never been to a drag show. So I think targeting any type of drag queen is completely wrong. It's, it's showing that you're, you have hatred towards somebody who can do makeup better than most women. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I've learned a lot from a drag queen. I have multiple friends that are drags. I have bartended at the Oz Bar and enjoyed it because they made me feel comfortable. They didn't make me feel uncomfortable. They made me feel like I had a place. And I'm bisexual. I'm not a lesbian. I'm not completely gay. I, I feel that if you don't understand the gay community, then you shouldn't be able to speak on it. I just don't feel that there's any way that you should have to be generalized in, well, you're a female, you're a male. That is not how my child felt. My child felt uncomfortable in his skin, and I accepted that. And now my child is going through transition, and I'm extremely proud of my child. And that's my son who is sitting back there. The bullying in the school. My child went through it. The teacher says, no, we have a, a way of being able for you to go to the bathroom. So you're not having to get bullied or beaten up in the men's bathroom or in the women's bathroom. That's why in some of the places I've seen, they have bathrooms that are no general female or male. And that's the way it should be all over. And drag queens, honestly, should really teach a lot of women how to do their makeup. I think that's the most spectacular thing besides how they encourage my child to take part to the gay community because he is trans. That is all I have to say. Thank you. Very Thank much. you for your time. Christy Rems. I apologize if I do not pronounce that correctly, but she'll do it for me. <sighs> All right, is that good? All right, Christy Rands, I live at 2010-51, County Road T in Marshfield. So. All right, actually, I think I have this memorized. Um, I'm here, I just wanna say thank you so much to Marshfield for planning to have the third Pride event this June. Um, to me, Pride events are all about the freedom for people to be themselves. It's a place where LGBTQ plus people, their families and friends come together and celebrate. It's an opportunity to make Marshfield a place where it includes all of us, a place where we are all free to thrive and support each other for who we are. Part of the celebration is drag shows. Drag shows are purely a form of entertainment. They're fun. They're really, really fun. I'd encourage people to go to them. To me, this builds on the theme of acceptance, openness, and fairness in Marshfield. I understand if someone doesn't want to go to a drag show, or you don't want to have your kids go to a drag show. That's perfectly fine. That's your prerogative. But it is wrong, insulting, oppressive, and I'd say un-American to tell me and my children what I can go do at a Pride event and what I can see. I think the mayor, and the city council's primary responsibilities is to ensure the safety and well-being of all constituents of Marshfield, not just a select few. This is exactly what Pride Month and Pride events are about. They are an opportunity to take action, engage in dialogue, to strengthen alliances, build acceptance, and advance equal rights for everyone. I hope the city council and the mayor see any effort against pride as one that means to divide our community, to control our lives, and to exploit hatred and fear. I think this is not what we want in Marshfield, and pride is a wonderful way to show we are a community of acceptance, love, and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Caleb Engenfold, I apologize. Hello, my name is Caleb Engenfold. I live at 300 West Arnold. Today I want to talk about a group of people who have played an essential role in making our society more accepting and inclusive. I am talking about drag queens and how they help others feel comfortable and confident about who they are. 
For those who are not familiar, familiar with drag culture, it's a form of artistic expression that involves performers dressing up in exaggerated costumes and makeup. I forgot where I was. Okay. All right. However, it's much more than that. Drag queens are not just entertainers. They are ambassadors of self-expression and individuality. I don't know if I said that right. <laughs> One of the most remarkable things about drag queens is their ability to create a safe and accepting space for people of all genders and sexualities. They provide a platform for individuals who feel misunderstood or rejected by society to be themselves fully. Through their performances, drag queens encourage others to embrace their uniqueness and celebrate their differences by challenging gender norms and stereotypes. They show that there is no one right way to express oneself. Moreover, drag queens help people to feel confident and comfortable in their own skin by embracing their own identities and being unapologetic, unapologetically themselves. They inspire others to do the same. They teach us that it's okay to be different and that they should embrace it. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. Aloiso Kilda. Um, my name is Allison Kildaw. I live at 305 West Depot in Marshfield. Um, I want to say thank you guys uh, for your um, time to listen um, with our community coming together. Sorry, I'm nervous. Um, again, my name is Allison. I go by she and her pronouns. Um, I came here tonight uh, to speak to you guys um, to uh, consider your guys' ongoing support with our annual Pride Fest. Uh, you each have, obviously, a variety of opinions in this room, each of you guys up there as well, uh, based off of false facts, real facts, mixed facts. The aspect that I ask is that you guys start sorting through these facts of mixed beliefs and start listening to the people who live, feel, and are a part of this community. Uh, I want to say that uh, our Pride event over the last three years here in town has not caused harm to anybody that I am aware of. If the council members up here can say or pinpoint an exact aspect of there is physical or emotional harm done to somebody, please address it to the community. But as far as my knowledge goes, it has not. I do know that there was a event last year where drag was involved, and we had protesters involved in front of our kids, in front of our families. It is a group of people that we come together to celebrate our love, our culture, our diversity. We embrace each other because all too common, we are targeted by others. Just because we love different, just because we support or we know people that are different. I want to say one thing, love is love. It does not matter if you're man and man, woman and woman, trans and trans, straight. Love is love. No one, however, is forced to come to these events. No one is forced to bring your children to these events. We go and our families go knowing what a pride event typically entails and that we are toleration. We tolerate, we accept, we breach, we bring com communities together. Pride councilmen and women is like our family. You hear from church members, it can be our church, since it is all too common that we are typically estranged from family members, friends, churchgoers, work. We find ourselves isolated on an island all too well. But through love, through acceptance, we find each other. So we embrace that with each other. I want to point out some people that many of you guys know that have done drag. As you've heard, drag is poisonous to our kids. Drag is evil. Robin Williams, I'm sure most of you guys have watched Mrs. Doubtfire. Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Pokemon, Porky Pig, John Travolta, Adam Sandler, Tom Hanks, just to name a few. But yet we watch these shows over and over, most of us as kids. Okay. Did that have an impact on anybody of our lives? No. Does that make you gay? Does that make you want to go into drag? 
Does that make you, as some people describe as, a sexual deviant? The answer is simply no. People come from all around to attend our pride, which overall councilmen and women, that helps our city as a whole. <clears throat> Businesses come here because they see a diverse aspect. They see acceptance of an aspect in our community. Drag is an art form. It is not a sexual explicit activity like some people like to say. Trust me, I see in a drag individual that I know here today outside of drag. Inside drag, two completely different people, but I embrace them as family. Okay, we are your neighbors. We are your coworkers. We are your teachers, your doctors, your lawyers, okay? We are just as important to this community as anybody else, and it is time to start accepting us as equals, okay? We pay our taxes just as much as anybody else in this city, and so we deserve the opportunities to engage in our activities that are not harming anybody in the public aspect. <sighs> Just so some of you guys are aware, without support, our queer youth suffer more by not feeling accepted, feeling more depressed, more miserable. There is an increased high of mental health with non-acceptance of our individuals and especially our youth. Okay, It is time to stop putting the bigotry and the hate and put that to the side and start embracing each other with love and acceptance like everybody here wants to preach, okay? So I ask you, as the you guys sitting up here tonight, if you guys had the choice, are you guys able to look and deny this group of individuals an annual pride event that brings people together and look at our children in their eyes and say, you don't matter? To say to our citizens that you are not welcome and to say to people you, that you are not safe in this community. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. <clears throat> Kevin Martin. Hi, my name is Kevin Martin. I live at 710 East Kelshed Street here in Marshfield. Um, oh, I came up here, I already had a speech prepared about talking how the pride in Marshfield brings e-commerce, brings money, tourists, business. But uh, sitting here listening to some of these speeches, it kind of saddens me that there's some misinformation about drag queens. Are the entertainment like RuPaul Drag Race? Absolutely. RuPaul is an entertainer and they're a drag queen. But there's also another side of drag queens that people don't seem to realize. How many people have heard of Marsha? Probably a couple people, okay. So drag queens are the forefront usually for, um, they're the forefront of HIV and AIDS activism, raising awareness and funds for research and support for those affected by that disease in the 18, I'm sorry, 1980s and 1990s, when HIV was a hugely stigmatized and misunderstood disease. Um, drag queens were the ones that stepped up and they cared for the ones that were sick and dying. Um, Marsha was a founding member of the Gay Liberation Front and co-founder of the Street Transvestite Action Revolution. Stop. With her friend, Sylvia Rivera. Now, I just want to preface, Marsha was actually transgender, even though she was labeled as a drag queen, um, because back then it was just easier. Um, with her friend, they worked with queer youth and sex workers in New York City to help them make them safe. Um, Marsha also was, if anyone heard of Stonewall, the riot, she was a big um, proponent of that too. But Marsha's activism was deeply intersected as she fought not only for LGBT rights, but also for racial and economic justice. She was an advocate for those who were marginalized and often forgotten by society. Unfortunately, Marsha's life was cut short when she was found dead in the Hudson River in 1992. Despite the police ruling her death as a suicide, many of the LGBT community believe that she was murdered. Um, today, Marsha's legacy lives on through those that practice drag. Um, I just want to say there. <laughs> People have an issue with the drag performance. They say it should be for adults. And I will say there absolutely are drag performance or should be for adults. But that's, your, that's a blanket statement. Not all drag is for adults. There's tons of kid-friendly and family-friendly drag. It's entertainment, it raises awareness, and they do good work in the community. Um, if you have any problems with it, if you're not sure about it, feel free to ask questions. I personally am more than welcome to answer questions. That's how we get to understanding. Um, and throughout tonight, there's a lot of talk about God this and God that. I'm not Christian. 
so why should I have to follow that religion when we have a separation of church and state, and I myself am not a Christian? That's like someone coming and saying, I'm Jewish, we need to get bacon out of Walmart. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Gary Holloway. Gary Holloway, 911 Martin Drive, Marshfield. Uh, it's been said tonight that um, if you don't understand gay community, you shouldn't speak on it. And perhaps the same should be said by some of the Bible verses that have been quoted tonight out of context. Just out of kindness, not out of meanness, not said that in meanness at all. It's just those verses were taken out of context uh, to state what uh, they truly uh, mean. Uh, it's also been said tonight that uh, our motivation is fear. And I can no more tell you your motivation than you can tell me my motivation. Uh, that's something that is within each of our own hearts. But um, I think it's time that we separate hatred and opposition. Just because there's opposition doesn't mean that there's hatred. There's always going to be opposing views. And we have to be okay with recognizing a conversation without declaring or labeling someone that they hate me. Um, we are concerned. We're concerned that the overt, hyper-sexualized attire and actions of a drag show um, draws, draws some of the highest concerns for a performance at a family plaza where the children will be present. And some not even planning to attend the show, but happening to walk, take a walk with their young children, and that's normal activity for a family plaza. I'm, I'm not alone with these concerns. According to the article published on nationalpublicradio.org February 8th of this year, nine state legislatures are currently pursuing proposed bills that will restrict or criminalize drag queen shows. Tennessee is working on a proposed bill in a subcommittee that will, quote, would make it a criminal offense for a drag artist to perform on public property or in a location where the show could be seen by a minor. Further, it prevents local ordinances from superseding this if it were to become state law, end quote. North Dakota recently advanced a bill that would, quote, criminalize performing drag in front of minors or in public spaces. And time doesn't allow us to discuss the further examples, but how, uh, we got Texas, West Virginia, Nebraska, South Carolina, to name a few, all filed proposed bills that are broad in scope and would effectively restrict drag show performances. 29 such bills passed into law just last year. A Las Vegas drag performer even gave an interview just this past weekend. Some of you may have seen it declaring that children should not be allowed to attend drag queen shows. And that's from the mouth of the drag queen um, himself. And that such entertainment is classified as adult entertainment. And that's his opinion. Let me give you the quote. Um, in talking about the drag shows, he said, quote, it's an adult venue, it's an adult entertainment, and I do not understand why anybody pretends it's not. And when the interviewer asked him, can drag queens dance in a non-sexual or educational way? He also said no, because drag queens get their training in adult entertainment venue, end quote. Madam Mayor, city council members, you can see the concerns are not merely from a small town viewpoint. These are concerns from state level legislators across the country and even a drag performer in the industry. And such a lack of moral values doesn't match the common voting values of our Wood County that's been demonstrated in the last few years. I would like to urge the Common Council to strongly consider moving this event to a venue that requires more purposeful action to attend. I understand First Amendment rights, not asking anyone's First Amendment rights to be removed. Um, but what we are asking is for um, the, the possibility that we would suggest a, a compromise of moving the Pride event activities to a very strong location, like the Fairgrounds Grand Station, uh, Grandstand. Um, this would provide a very strong location for the event. It also remove it from the, the view of minors in a casual area like uh, a, a park. We would also not allow our children or teens, we wouldn't allow our children or teens to approach a woman dressed in the same fashions that are pictured 
on Facebook on the Marsh Marshfield Pride drag show picture. If that woman was dressed that way on a corner at night, we wouldn't give him a dollar bill and say, go talk to that lady and go give it her, go give her a tip. And why would we allow men to dress in the same fashions and call it family entertainment for our children? The industry itself declares this entertainment's not meant for children. 29 states have already passed laws restricting drag shows from a child's view. Nine more states are pursuing similar restrictions. A viable option for a change of venue is a good compromise, and yet still keeping everyone in their place, in their opportunities and in their, their freedoms. Please do not turn a blind eye to what so many states in our country have already concluded. Thank you, Gary. Josette Kaiser. Hello, this is Josette Kaiser. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm here to speak on behalf of the Pride event happening. Pardon me, Josette, your address, please. 1501 Emanuel Court. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> um, happening as usual. To start, I'm 14, part of the LGBTQ+, I identify as bisexual. Um, I am very young, as you can tell, and most people up here have not been, like, under the age of 18. Um, I will be speaking of my experience as a person under the age of 18 who is a part of the community. Um, to start, I grew up in a very Christian family. My mom is here. Um, she is and was a pastor. Um, she has taught me nothing but love and acceptance as a Christian and person of faith. Um, she taught me that um, love is unconditional and we should spread that wherever we go because um, my personal opinion is we put into the world what we're gonna get back. And if we put into the world love, we're gonna get back love from future generations um, and for ourselves as well because self-love is important. And I believe this Pride event helps people of youth in the LGBTQ love who they are and accept who they are. It's not only about loving others, but also about loving ourselves. Um, and we have seen spikes of mental health um, that we haven't been seeing for the past forever. <laughs> um, and I believe part of this is that suppression of love towards everyone, whether that be yourself or towards other people. Um, this event means so much to me and I'm sure so many others as well for many different reasons. Whether you have a kid who is a part of the community, a sibling, a parent, or you yourself, so many people are looking forward to celebrating the differences that make us able to show love to ourselves and others. I came here today because when I started to realize I don't only like guys, I remember how distraught and alone I felt at first, and I don't want anyone else to have to feel that way when they first recognize that they are not the social norm. Um, I came here for others like me and unlike me all the same. I want people that are part of the LGBTQ to have pride in who they are because no one should feel ashamed for the love they were born with. All in all, I came here today to promote love and acceptance as well as tolerance. But I came here most importantly today to, pro to promote love for oneself, which comes with LGBTQ pride, especially for youth. <laughs> Thank you, Josette. Judah Ford. Uh, 
Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Judah Ford. My address is 1005 East Grand Street. Listening to people speak here, I think that a lot of the people who are on the side of this drag event happening here in town are doing everything they can to avoid addressing the actual concern that people have. It say, they say it's an issue of love. I'd like to ask you, if you had men who did not identify as LGBT, just men out there acting provocatively, dressing provocatively, dancing provocatively, and trying to get children to come up and stick dollar bills in their underwear, would we call that love? Would we call that Please. love? We'd call that a threat to our community. We'd call that a threat to our children. That's what predators look like. If those were women, straight women, doing the exact same thing, everyone here would have the exact same concern. This is not an LGBT issue. This is an issue of, as that shirt says, creating a safe space, letting Marshfield be a safe place for children where they're not preyed upon. When you sexualize children at a young age and children are exposed to pornography, which no make mistake, make no mistake, a drag show is live softcore porn for the most part. It's an adult entertainment show. There is stripping, provocative dressing, provocative dancing. There is study after study that shows children who are exposed to that have worse outcomes with their mental health, worse outcomes with their employment. They are more likely to be abusive in relationships. They are more likely to be abused in relationships. What these people are asking to expose children to is extremely harmful to the families here in Marshfield. This is not an LGBT issue. This is not an issue of love or hate. It is not a loving thing to expose children to danger, which is exactly what they're asking you to do. As a Christian, I believe all men and all women were created in the image of God. And I believe that God loves every single person here, whether they have a rainbow flag or they're wearing a cross, enough to die for them. And I love those people too, very much. But it is not an act of love to subject a child to that. That was all I had to say, thank you. Thank you, Judah. Liam. Oh, boy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll let you take the rest. Perfect. Thank you. And it'll be real simple. You know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes people say it like an onomatopoeia, like a plan, but it's just Kaplan. It's been it. Um, uh, my name is Liam Kaplan, and I live at 2511 Lorraine Street here in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Oh, the button? Nope, the button's on. Just push it down. There you go. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Like she said, it's not made for short people. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm here urging you, uh, city council members, to allow to pride to continue as it did last year, including the drag show. Um, contrary to what opponents of our pride event may believe, drag does not have to be inherently sexual. It is simply a performing art form that involves elements of dance, makeup, and wardrobe. Uh, so there is differences between dance and erotic dance. Anyone who is familiar with the performing arts knows that um, any art form can be inappropriate and any art form can be appropriate in a family setting. Uh, I would like to point out this, this is a amateur drag race. So anyone is invited to uh, come up with a routine themselves and sign up to perform for us, if they would like. Uh, anyone is invited to watch. Um, uh, they're family friendly because they are in a public space. Uh, the performance is an act of expression and it is open for anyone to participate, like I alluded to. Um, it is a free event, so performers may ask for tips. 
uh, and that is kind of part of the show. They make a show out of it, but it's really just going back to pay for all those supplies and fancy makeup, costumes, gas money, um, uh, just as you would tip a street musician for playing you a song. Uh, so there's nothing inherently wrong like that type of perform performance uh, when just looking at as an art form. We must not let opinions, opinions of some impact the right for indi individuals to express themselves. <clears throat> Gender has become seen as more of a fluid act uh, because more and more we're collect, connected globally and see that um, gender is, as we see it, is defined by a lot of the Western tradition, uh, especially in our culture. It comes a lot from Western culture. Uh, so certain forms of expression may seem strange, especially viewed by those unfamiliar with a certain culture. Uh, but we cannot set a president that validates that as an excuse to ban freedom of expression. I am 17 years old, uh, trans, I'm trans, and I've seen my world react to some of those like me who challenge social norms. It's been four years since I've socially transitioned and I've gone from my lowest point of depression to enthusiastically planning for my future and my next step with college. I transitioned because I felt like it was right for me, not because anyone told me to do so. Pride is a place to express my joy of existence as my authentic self. I find it especially important for people to see this joy in a nation which some states have suppressed it, as one of the former speakers alluded to. I implore you to allow this joy and expression to go through and to protect our First Amendment rights in the process. Just because some states have banned this form of expression does not mean it is right, and it does not mean we should follow them. Uh, in fact, I think that our Pride event sets an example for uh, what we should do and what form of expression we should allow within our community. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Bill Zernhet. Mayor, members of the council. <clears throat> My name is Bill Zernhelt. I live at 1206 East 27th Street. I've been a resident in Marshfield since February 1970. I married in 71. My wife and I had two children, and we raised them here in Marshfield. They attended the school system. At no time was there ever a concern with me bringing my young boys downtown Marshfield and walking the streets, going to any of the venues throughout the city. I'm now a grandfather and just lately a great grandfather. I do now have concerns about bringing my grandchildren and great grandchild down to downtown Marshfield, especially in the month of June when the, when the Winslow Plaza is occupied for this demonstration, performance, show, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> I would, I'm not again, I don't, don't hate the, the, the community, the, the gay pride community. I think, first of all, we're all created by one God and, and he does teach us to love. And I, my concern is that we're using a public venue, uh, a family park, next to a government building that has to be visited by, by the community. Uh, uh, they have no choice but to come down Chestnut, go to the post office, et cetera. They don't have to go into the plaza. But however, I know from talking with a, a family member, that a family individual who did come to the post office last year, parked his car on Chestnut and had two little children in the car, and then had to spend a half hour explaining to them what was going on in the park and why these men were dressed up as women. So it does have an effect on, on the general population. My suggestion was, as we heard from several before, is to move it off the public venue 
I think I think the fairgrounds would be a wonderful place for for their performance or their show or whatever they want to call it. Uh, and people would have to make an effort to go into it. And if they did, uh, that's their choice. Uh, I don't, you know, we we have a theater in town. Uh, and I know there's there's all sorts of movies that play in there, and they're all rated. They have a, rates, and if a, a movie is, I don't know what even the, I know it's X-rated. It's probably the worst. If if that is up there, uh, parents can say, uh-uh, child, you're not going to that. But we have no idea how this this performance show is is rated. Uh, I I admit I've never been to one. Uh, I don't want to expose myself to any of that. I don't go to bars. I don't do things that I feel wrong. So I would just ask the mayor and the common council to truly consider a change of venue. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And I'm going to give this person's address because the first and last name, I'm not even going to try to guess. 3138 Yellowstone. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm known, I'm known my address. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Caldwell. I live at 3138 Yellowstone Drive in Millardor, a road in Millardor. Um, and as someone who's just recently retired, uh, having worked for 22 years in Marshfield, I asked to speak in opposition to the scheduled public drag queen event uh, in the city center. I'm opposed to the event uh, due to what I'm concerned may be that aspects might be derogatory to women and inappropriate to children. I'm going to quote from a couple of sources after I took my concerns and sort of searched the internet. I'm going to talk from um, uh, Kelly Kleinman, who's a feminist Chicago attorney known for her work in the nonprofit arena. And also from an organization that's known as um, Gays Against um, Groomers, Gays Against Groomers. Um, I interpret the term drag queen to mean men dressing as women in public performance. The performances may be glamorous or comic and presented by gay men or straight men. Nonetheless, to quote Kelly Kleinman, all of them represent a continuing insult to women. And this is apparent from the parallels between these performances and those of white performers of blackface men, um, men, minstrelsy. Minstrel Ms. Kleeman um, uh, wrote an essay when she was finishing law school, and I'm going to quote from a few parts of it. First, she relates the drag and blackface are both a masquerade in which powerful or privileged people dress up as less powerful or less privileged people. Second, that drag and blackface originated when the impersonated people were excluded from the stage. However, each has outlisted that original excuse. Third, drag and blackface show the persons being impersonated in a restricted range of behaviors. African Americans are shown singing, dancing, being foolish, or longing for the old plantation, and women are shown primping, nagging, or longing for male protection. Fourth, the terms, the forms of drag and blackface perform the same function to end, to ease the minds of an audience threatened by um, presenting the agents uh, of change as ridiculous rather than frightening. Ms. Kleiman further uh, relates that the parallels between drag and blackface are so obvious that it seems bizarre that the intellectual consensus against blackface has not formed against drag. Instead, defenses of the practice continue to appear. All four of the principal defenses she believes are false. Drag is not liberating challenge to gender stereotypes, nor is it a timeless statement of gay pride, nor is it legitimated by female cross-dressing, a practice which is separate and unequal, nor is it funny. Just as African Americans were taught by blacked up white minstrels that they ought to shuffle and were important, White men were taught to expect African Americans to shuffle. Women are taught by dolled up male glamour girls and pantomime dames to be hypersexual and shown that failure to do so renders them repulsive and superfluous. 
Again, more important, men are taught the same lesson. The people keeping drag alive are the people who benefit somehow from the argument that being a woman is something you can just put on and take off. Their claim is very simple, drag is funny. What exactly is funny about it? Perhaps it's the, it is the simple incongruity. You can always knock them dead with chest hair pouring out of the cleavage of an evening gown. But there had to be something else. There was ridicule. What was funny was the glimpse back blackface purported to offer into the world of African Americans. Aren't they stupid? Don't they have weird physical features? But they sing good songs and they dance funny dances and doesn't that prove they're happy in the confinement in which we place them? Men who dress up as women and adopt stereotyped feminine behaviors are comical because of their stereotype behavior. And the inference they encourage the audience to draw is not that stereotypes are comical, but that women are. Not that social restrictions are foolish, but that the people restricted are. Thus, drag's humor depends entirely on the audience's willingness to believe that women are rightfully the butt of every joke. Clement concludes, the drag queen is a symbol of everything women reject in men's thinking about gender, and the relish of drag performance by performer and audience alike is every woman's goal. Also to the second point, that of child protection. I refer the council to the organization Gay Against Thank Grooms. Thank you, Michael. Anna, mine. All right. Here's some even. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Hannah Moyne, and I live at 311 West Fifth Street in Marshall, Wisconsin. Um, I suck at speaking, so this is going to be fun. Um, Okay, so my actual name is Aspen Moyne. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. Um, okay, um, I talked at the previous city hall meeting about my opinions and my viewpoints. Um, however, apparently this is still an issue, so I'm gonna keep talking about this. Um, 74 uh, students and youth have been killed in school shootings this year, and yet the church and a lot of people in America are more worried about drag performance and gun control. Um, the fact of the matter is, as w in a similar fashion, um, in uh, the last hundred years, in drag performers, both private and public, there have been three cases of sexual assault with a ch of minor sexual assault on a child. There have been 850 in a church or religious building. Um, so the fact that uh, church goers put their focus on drag shows instead of um, trying to fix the issues within their church and how that there have been 850 times more is a little daunting. Um, but I'm really excited about this year's Pride. I think it's going to be just as fun and child safe as last year and even more so. Um, I think there are going to be the same amount of people spreading hate as there was last year. And that makes me sad that a group of people can't show up and spread love without it being a problem to some people. But whatever. Um, I brought my little three-year-old sister to the same to the last event. And I will be bringing my little sister to the same event next to the next event as well. She had a blast, and the only time she had an issue was in when she got distracted by the loud yelling men with big signs trying to ruin her fun, but I'll explain that to her then too, and she will have to survive. Um, I long for the day that I don't have to come and advocating for my rights at the age of 17 when I should probably be studying. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Jim Fleck. Good evening. My name is Jim Fleck. I live at 2019 East Becker Road in Marshfield. And I just want to <clears throat> thank you, City Council, Mayor, members of Common Council for the opportunity. I really learned a lot here tonight. I 
I, um, I have really learned a lot. Um, I, I came to Marshfield with my family 33 years ago in June, and I, I came to be a part of an evangelical church. I didn't even have a job when I came here. And, uh, the, and I learned some amazing things in those first three years because uh, I, was, uh, I was one of those judgmental kind of Christians, you know. And I remember uh, the pastor changed my life one Sunday morning when he said, what you need to do is you need to show everyone unconditional love and acceptance. That's what Jesus did. And God the Father would Jesus pleased as he could possibly be if you could do life exactly the way his son did when he walked the earth. Um, so if we look at an incident, take a specific incident, take the woman caught in the act of adultery. And so these, uh, these self-righteous Pharisees caught this woman in the act of adultery. And, uh, and so they're going to, they're going to trap Jesus by making him defy the laws of Moses. Back in uh, Leviticus, it says that people that commit adultery should be uh, stoned. So they bring this woman to Jesus and they say, this is what the laws of Moses say. So what do you say? And what's interesting is if you go back to the book of Leviticus that they're recording, it's interesting to look at some of the other sins that are punishable by death. Fornication, adultery, disobedience to parents, it's punishable by death. But, uh, but, but you got to read the whole, uh, one of my mentors, Creflo Dollar, says context is king. He, uh, he said, okay, the, uh, the one of you, each of you who, who is without sin, cast the first stone. And then he wrote on the ground, we don't know what, but one by one they walked away. Um, and uh, then he stood up and he said, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, there are none, Lord. And he said, then neither do I accuse you. But he also said, go and sin no more. Okay, our concern here, the Christian community, is for our children. They have to be 18 to buy tobacco products. They have to be 18 to get a tattoo. They have to be 21 to buy alcohol. Um, I don't think they're in business anymore, but we had to, we're, we're in south of town. Those ladies were practicing their art. Their art was sexualization of the audience, but they had to do it in, in, a, in a closed building. I think there was a cover charge and an age limit. Same thing for the New Yorker Club up in Wausau. Yeah, those ladies are practicing their art. I don't have any taste for it, but... They have a constitution right to do that. No one has a constitution right to sexualize our children. Okay, that's, that's number one. No, number two, Jesus, Jesus said offenses will come, but woe unto him who brings the offense. Anyone who causes one of these little ones to sin, it would be better for him if he had a lodestone tied around his neck and he cast into the ocean. Um, so what that says to us, if you believe the Bible, is um, that we have an awesome responsibility here as Marshfield citizens. And, and the third thing that, that I don't think I was looking at, and I know this is politically incorrect, but it's true, um, there, there, there is a very well-designed and developed Marxist-Communist conspiracy to destroy America. A very, very well-designed conspiracy. And uh, recently we went to our institutions and asked them to deal with some of the lawlessness and only to find out that they had been bribed or blackmailed or bullied or somehow intimidated not to do their job. But the conspiracy is there. When I was a high school student, we were, we were uh, told that we must, we must go fight the Vietnam War to push back the tide of communism. And, and, and now, now we've got a government in Washington uh, 
trying to make us a, a third world country. What, what's the point? The point is that every country where Thank that you. was done, sexualization of the Thank children. You, Jim, your five minutes is up. Was part of the plan. Thank you. Chris Stargart. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members, my fellow citizens. My name is Chris Stargard. I live at 1031 Laird Street here in Marshfield. Um, I would like to speak on behalf of allowing the Pride event. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any issues um, or arrests in the last two events, so I'm not sure why there's an uproar about it this year, since it actually went off without a hitch. I also would like to read from the Constitution of the United States, our Amendment 1, which is Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, which means the city should not, the city, county, state, country does not have a state religion. You cannot force religion on other people. Therefore, I think there should be no argument stating a religious reason to deny this event. Also in the amendment says that there's no abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people to peacefully assemble. And that's all these people want to do is peacefully assemble. And in fact, if I were them and I was denied this event, I guess I would contact the ACLU and see if someone would like to sue the city on their behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Al Leonard. <clears throat> Al Leonard, 305 West 14th Street, Marshfield. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members, for hearing this debate this evening. Just would like to say that I grew up in Marshfield, born and raised. I'm 67 years old now. I've seen the city change a lot since I've been a member of this city. I love Marshfield and I've seen it grow and a lot change over the years. About the worst thing I ever had to worry about was the chain falling off my bicycle, but Today, we've got different things. Like Dorothy pointed out about the rainbow, God's promise, never flood this world again. That's a good thing. But he's got different plans, different strategies for dealing with things that he doesn't really care for. Yeah, it's true, he loves everybody. I agree with that. But like the fellow in the purple shirt cited, Galatians 3, Paul is talking about those who are saved. Not all, but those who are saved. So I stand here today. I'm not real in favor of it in our city. I would say, you could find a different place, that would be great. They'd understand the rights of everybody. Um, I would like to cite two scriptures, because yes, I am a Christian, and that is a bad word for a lot of people. I understand that. <clears throat> I learned the truth when I was 25 years old. Before that, I made some stupid mistakes, like everybody does. 
But the scripture I'd like to cite is beginning of Matthew 24, where Jesus said, don't let anyone deceive you. And another scripture in Proverbs that says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in its end is a way of death. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Kellen Jepson. Okay, uh, my name is Kellen Jepson. I live at 800 West Blodgett Street in Marshfield. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I and my family have organized Pride. This is our third year. Um, yeah, thank you to everyone that showed up today to support Marshfield Pride. Um, if you've been to a Marshfield Pride event, you know that there's lots of love there. Um, there's lots of support for people that really need it. Um, there are people in our community that really struggle um, because they are part of the LGBTQIA plus community. And uh, the more that people can be supported, that's what we wanna do. We wanna wrap our arms around people. So that's uh, what our event is for. Um, I think that it's important that if there's confusion about what pride is or um, anything really that is uh, surrounding pride that, um, Madam Mayor and the council knows that we are open to having discussions. Uh, if there are questions, we're really happy to do that. Um, if people in our community have questions, that's, uh, you know, we are happy to have discussions with people because I think that there's a lot of misinformation. There is a lot of confusion. Um, and so if there's anything that we can do to kind of help people to understand why we organize this event, we are more than open to doing that. Um, I have to go because my daughter has a band concert and the rest of my family wants to speak as well. But I just want to say thank you to everybody that came to support Pride and thank you to our awesome drag queens because they're amazing. Um, also, my brother was a drag king last year and it was the event of his life. So um, there's there's so much love in this event in this event and let's not let um, you know hate overcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Kellen. Will Jepson. Okay, is this working? Okay, cool. Um, my name is Will Jepson. Um, I live at 800 West Blodgett Street. <laughs> And um, I was lucky enough to be one of the organizers for Pride for the last two years, along with my two lovely lesbian mothers. Um, so um, today I'd just like to um, address the council and the mayor and the rest of um, this wonderful group of people that we have here um, as a testament to what I saw Pride as last year. Um, being um, a young queer person in this town, I understand how difficult it can be to find um, spaces where you feel welcome. So our goal in Pride is creating a space where you are welcome to be whoever you want to be. And part of that is drag, not all of it. Um, last year at Pride, I spent most of the day inside of a food tent serving free food to anyone who wanted food. We had water. I made multiple runs to the store to go and pick up more supplies because there were so many people that day who wanted to share love and wanted to be part of a community. Um, let's talk about drag. Um, so I've heard a lot about drag today and being a person who has watched enough drag race for everyone in this room 10 times over. Um, <laughs> I can assure you that there are very different types of drag. Um, there is absolutely more explicit drag that does belong in nightclubs. I agree with you on that. There is some drag that should be restricted age-wise a little bit. Um, I've been to different types of drag shows. I've been to indoor drag shows. I've been to drag brunches. I've been to our Marshfield Pride 
Um, there are different types of drag. Our drag was very family friendly. Um, I've heard a lot of lies that it was not. Um, and I'd just like to see some evidence of that. Um, I mean, there were hundreds of people in the park that day and very few people are here today to tell us that um, our drag queens are sexual pedophiles. And a lot of the people who are speaking to that, I did not recognize at the event. Um, and then, yeah, um, also tipping. I've heard a lot of complaints with tipping. Um, drag queens perform an art and entertainment, and in that way, they're service workers. So tipping them is very comparable to tipping a waiter or a waitress, which is common in our society because they also are underpaid. Um, <laughs> and where am I going next? Oh, also, um, I earlier um, I heard, uh, um, along with the audio that was played, um, I heard someone equate um, all drag performers to strippers. Um, and I'd just like to clarify that we have two queens who were at Pride last year who won't be able to join us this year. One of them is working on her PhD at the moment in Madison. Um, so she has a doctorate program that she's going to be busy with. And then another one of our queens, um, she is currently overseas serving in the military. So I don't, I think a lot of us would agree that um, military members are certainly some of the most respectable people in our society. So I'm not quite sure why we're attacking them. Um, but yeah, that is all. Um, thank you all. Um, I believe that pride is essential to creating a safe environment in our community. And I'd encourage that it um, continues on in its whole form. So thank you. Thank you, Will. Steven Steingruber. Steven Steingruber, 1208 East 6th Street. I am not here for the talking about Pride Month or anything, so if you want to sip over me to the end, you can. Otherwise, I'll take my comments now. Thank you, Steven. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Kristen Rigel. Hello, my name is Kristen Rigel, uh, 800 West Blodgett Street in Marshfield. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of the things that y'all said. Um, there is no nudity. Uh, sex, of course, no nudity, sex, or drugs at Marshfield Pride Drag Show. Um, I can assure you that is not something that we would stand by, okay? I, I want you to hear me. Uh, that's not something that we would stand by. Uh, last year, we, we requested law enforcement um, be present, um, and we will again this year, um, mostly for our safety, but also to make sure the laws are abided by, okay? Um, we are not sexualizing children. Um, no one is condoning children touching any adults in any sexual manner. Um, I believe that every single person in this room um, would expect that those individuals be prosecuted um, if that were to happen. Um, if the protester's concern is for children who be, may be walking past the park, um, may I suggest that the protesters um, who chose to watch the drag show last year stand a block, maybe even two blocks away, um, and uh, advise any uh, bypassers of the event. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Remember, folks, she gets her five minutes like everyone else did. I won't Thank need you very much. Um, we can happily consider tipping in buckets, similar to um, that on a Sunday morning tithe basket, okay? Um, will you stop saying that we're sexualizing children then? No, of course not, because your minds have already been made up about us. That's why none of us believe you when you say that you don't hate us. You already pretend to know us, and you don't. Allies, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, yes. Um, LGBTQ humans in this room, you are so loved, you are so valued. Um, if it matters to you, God loves you exactly how you are. 
All right, uh, we will not hide, and I am so excited to see you all June 24th. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Ace Lee. Okay, sorry. Um, my name is Ace Lee, and I live at 504 North Cherry Avenue. Um, my pronouns are he, him. Um, for the past two years, Marshfield has had the grand and fabulous honor of hosting a Pride event at Wenzel's Plaza. Being able to say that, um, especially considering Marshfield um, is hosting Pride, um, is something that 12-year-old me wouldn't have ever believed. Um, uh, when I was 12, I didn't think that anybody else in my community was like me. I knew some people that were in my grade, but I didn't know of any adults or anything like that. Um, so the idea that Pride is being hosted in, in Wenzel's Plaza, which is such a public place, w is just wild to me still. Um, with the community's positive reaction towards it, for the most part, um, hopefully it'll become an annual tradition um, that lasts and helps kids that were like me when I was younger um, realize that there are more of us around. Um, uh, the first year's agenda consisted of chalk art, live music, and public speaking, and a little bit of karaoke at the end. Um, and while the turnout was small, uh, it was impressive for the event's first occurrence. In 2022, the agenda boasted much more. Uh, small vendors uh, tabled at the event, which brought business and interests to the plaza. Um, I had the opportunity to help run the uh, MHS Gender Sexuality Alliance table along with my friends Liam and Dean um, uh, as an officer on the Gender Sexuality uh, Club. Um, and then live music and speaking was hosted after a march around the downtown area happened, and the event concluded with a live drag performance. Um, last year, the size of Pride easily tripled. Um, the agenda and popularity of the event definitely helped the increase in turnout. Um, and uh, I personally had a lot of fun. Um, um, Sorry. <laughs> With Pride being a place for all to come, though, and celebrate love and the ability to do that freely, uh, the increase was expected, and the drag performance um, especially was fun. Uh, my friends and I had a great time during that. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, sorry, my show's a font size way too small for my eyes. <laughs> Um, I've been figure skating my whole life, so the performance world is not unfamiliar to me. Um, drag has always been such an interesting and fun way to express oneself, and it was a lot of fun to be able to see live. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, it's theater, it's performance art, and it has, um, since after seeing it live has inspired me, but in an artistic way. Um, it, it, it inspires a lot of the aspects um, of uh, just general like fashion sense. I don't know if that's obvious or not right now, but um, and uh, just digital art and uh, music that I listen to and makeup and everything like that. Um, while providing um, entertainment uh, and art, it is also a fundamental part of the LGBTQ community um, and is an integral part of the history of celebrating queer pride. Um, the history behind drag makeup, dress, and performance um, is immutable, and from the early days of the gay rights movement and challenging social norms through experimental self-expression. Many pivotal figures in the push for gay, gay rights were drag queens, uh, and without drag, there is no pride. They're mutually exclusive. When I was uh, 14 at the first Marshfield Pride, I presented a speech I'd written about unity within the LGBTQ community, how loving each other and supporting each other in times of need um, is essential to create a safe and connected community. This stands true still today. 
Being accepting of one another and being united is the only way to create a functional, thriving community. Pride and art are important to me. Expressing myself is important to me. And having a place where I feel safe to celebrate equality and love is important to me. Living and being a part of a community that I know will take care of me and support me if I need it is important to me as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ace. Nicole Lane. So between three, you get five minutes. Yes. Thank you. And will you all be speaking? Yes. We're all okay, so if you would please give your name and address each one of you. Hi, everybody. I'm Nicole Lane. My address is 2303 East Hints, Marshfield, Wisconsin. I am Amy Delaney. I live at 411A West 10th Ave, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Uh, I am Jacob Deglow. I live at 1213 North Peach Avenue in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Thank you. So, obviously, I just said I'm from, Mar um, not Marshfield. <laughs> Gosh, I'm in Marshfield today. Um, I am here with two of my best friends in the entire world. Um, and although Marshfield Pride does not directly affect me, it affects these two. And so because of that, I am here. And the first thing that I wanted to say is please separate art from the artist. Drag is a form of art. Take Michael Jackson, for example. Are you choosing to forget that he was a pedophile? But yet you listen to his songs, and I guarantee any time Billie Jean comes on or Thriller comes on, you're dancing, and you don't care. Separate the art from the artist. This, that's great for you. Anyway, the second thing I wanted to say <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the second thing that I wanted to say is that please stop referring this as referring to this as just a drag show. This is pride. This means so much more than just a drag show. It is one part of the day, and if you don't like it, don't walk your kids past that side of town. Thank you. Hi, everybody again. Um, Grandma, I love you, but you're on the wrong side of this one. I am a bisexual female. I like men, I like women. Pride means so much to me because for so long, I couldn't be who I was because of people like my grandmother. I'm so sorry, but that's, that's just the way it is. Um, Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. <laughs> um, not being able to be who you are puts you in such a horrible place mentally. Um, it's just, it's, it's a hard thing to go through. And taking that away from all of these people who are there to support our youth. I can tell you right now, I felt more judged in my Catholic church than I did at Pride events. Everybody here that is for Pride has accepted me for who I am. Taking that away from our children, our youth that want to feel love and acceptance is not okay. That is a form of abuse and neglect. I'm gonna cut myself there so you have time. <laughs> I was actually one of the drag queens at um, Pride last year. And a, few, a lot of you probably don't recognize me because I'm a very different person out of drag. <laughs> but um, it means so much to me to have these events because it gives us an outlet for our creativity. We are not trying to groom or sexualize any type of children. We are just trying to have a good time and put on a show. And for a lot of us drag queens, it is literally a profession. There are some queens that actually do this full time. It is their livelihood. It is how they make money. It is how they pay their bills. 
And with that being said, um, that's the main reason I really want the Pride event to continue. I mean, it's a really inspiration to everybody. And my goal as a drag queen is to inspire children and inspire other people to be who they want to be, be their truest and most authentic self. Thank you. Thank you, three. Now, Steven Stein Greber is going to come up. If you would like to exit because he is not going to talk about pride, or you would like to stay and listen to what he has to say, again, we live here because we have choices. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Pardon me. I'm sorry, Steve. Um, Steve Barg, I apologize. He's got two people that actually ask. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Steven. Yeah. And I'm not sure if we were supposed to, yeah, right. If we were supposed to go get him. I don't know. I, there he comes. Okay. Steve, you're muted. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. And I, and I do apologize for taking a minute to jump in there, Mayor. Uh, I thought maybe we were going to let Steve go first, but it does make sense to put all the pride related ones together. I'm going to read three emails that I received today from citizens. And uh, I did indicate that I would read them as they requested. So I will uh, proceed here. The first one is from Mary McShane. And here's what she says. I'm unable to attend the council meeting this evening. I wanted to send an email, which I would like to have as public comment. Pride events, festivals, and parades are part of the fabric of our culture and community. I fully support safe city sanction and consideration of events that allow freedom of speech and expression Thank you for your time and consideration and gratitude, Mary McShane. Uh, next one is from uh, Jenny Jershley. My name is Jenny Jershley and I reside at 2308 East Fillmore Street in Marshfield. I realize this, this email may come too late to be read into the public record. It's a nice common council meeting, but I wanted to voice my support regarding Marshfield's upcoming pride event and drag show. Suicide is the second leading cause among young people aged 10 to 24, and LGBTQ youth are at a significantly increased risk due to the discrimination, rejection, fear, and harassment that may come with being LGBTQ in an unsupportive environment. LGBTQ youth are more than four times as likely to attempt suicide than their peers. The Trevor Project estimates that more than 1.8 million LGBTQ youth seriously consider suicide every year in the United States, and at least one attempt suicide every 45 seconds. Age appropriate drag shows like last year's Pride performance and the recent drag bingo night sponsored by Cummins Incorporated, Fannies and PFLAG provide a venue for LGBTQ youth and adults to feel safe, affirmed and welcome within our community. Plus creating a safe space where people can be themselves benefits all. When people see others included, they are more likely to feel included too not to mention that the shows are incredibly entertaining. I support drag entertainment and Marshfield Pride, and I hope that you will too. I look forward to another great event this year, signed Jenny Jershley. And then the third and final one that I received, uh, again, all of them today. Uh, I understand that there's a group speaking out against the Marshfield Pride event at this evening's common council meeting. Uh, if that is the case, please consider my comment below as public comment, if at all possible. My name is John White Jr. and I live at 206 South Schmidt Avenue in Marshfield. I'd like to make a quick public comment through email as I'm out of town at a work conference and will not be able to attend Tuesday's Common Council meeting. I understand that there's a group commenting against the Pride event that is planned by a group that is rented out Wenzel Family Plaza. My comment is in support of the Pride event at the Plaza. Last year, I attended the event during the first half of the day. Outside of the hateful statements disguised as Bible verses talked on the perimeter sidewalks and the group of protesters viewing hate through a bullhorn, I was filled with warm emotion as I watched the community come together to show support and love for one another in a welcoming and inclusive environment. Our community should be proud that there are groups like the organizers of the Marshfield Pride event who are simply providing a loving and inclusive environment for people of all ages to be themselves. 
I fully support this event and choose to tune out hate. Thank you, John White Jr. Those are the three letters that I received today. Thank you, Steve. And now, Stephen, with further ado, it is your turn. Can we go? Please let's be respectful of our speaker if you want to just leave the room or if you want to stay, but we need to keep this meeting going. Thank you very much. Stephen? Thank you. My name is Stephen Steingerber from 1208 East 6th Street. I'd like to start my comments tonight by thanking the Common Council for the opportunity you gave me to serve the City of Marshfield on the Police and Fire Commission. It's been something I've always wanted to do, and I thank you for your faith in me discharging those duties. I thoroughly enjoyed the time of my time on the commission and will always consider it a highlight of my civilian career. Unfortunately, I also come with concerns on the manner in which my seat on the commission was filled. I was confused when I saw a posting for boards and commissions at the end of March that did not include my seat. I was very sad to see that the process was not publicly solicited for openly and a contentious candidate was appointed. While I do approve of the posting for the current police and fire commissioner vacancy, it is unfortunate that the council did not choose to reappoint Mike March to the commission. Well, I cannot tell you who to uh, put on the commission. That is your job at the end of the day. I do have three thoughts on the type of person you need to put there. Please find a person of character. Character is something needed with all the conflicts in the past of the city of Marshfield. This person should also have the uh, ability to collaborate. While well, personalities will class regardless of the best intentions of appointments, having a group that can productively collaborate is greatly to be desired. Finally, the last trait should be sought out, if possible, is knowledge of human resources for the police and fire service. I believe there was an email that Steve Barg sent out probably two or three months ago that had a training that was for police and fire commissioners. And it was striking to me that the last slide on that um, PowerPoint had uh, human resources or prior public safety knowledge, which seemed in my, when I was appointed, the common council was actively trying to avoid those traits and I didn't know why, it, it did not make sense to me. Um, I also have comments toward the listening public. Talk is cheap. Facebook talk is the cheapest of all. It, it'd be, I, I appreciate this group that was here because this is what public comment is supposed to be, emailing your government officials, and coming down here and speaking. Cheap talk, useful, wasteful talk on Facebook is not productive. Just watch all the posts that were out there for our, our referendum for police and fire. So for those people who have opinions from their um, bar stools or from their kitchen tables, come down here, sign up. There are positions open. Come down here, raise your hand, and get involved. Otherwise, please stop the useless chatter. And as I am also a Christian, and it's been my practice here before, I will pray for you because it seems like you have a great deal of decision-making to do here. So it's good that I'm here. Lord God of heaven and earth, bless this your common council, the city of Marshfield. Give them wisdom and courage. Bless also the city staff and also your defenders and protectors. Give them wisdom and courage and strength as they discharge their duties. Let peace and unity come to your city of Marshfield. I'll let your name go through all the earth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. There ends public comment. How about we take about a 10 minute break? Yes. So meet back here at five, about five after eight ish.
Okay. Item H, approval of minutes, April 25th, 2023. Someone will please move to approve the minutes. On the board, please. On the board, please press your on the board. <laughs> Motion by Mr. Uh, Alderman O'Reilly, second by Alderman Varsho. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. Yeah. All eyes, thank you. I, staff updates. I'm not aware of any at this point. Okay, buzzing right along. Jay, mayor's comments. Employee recognition. Jason Femmel, police department, 10 years. Congratulations, Jason. Joel Gohan, water waste, 10 years. Congratulations, Joel. And Mitch Gosbich, water waste, 10 years. Congratulations, Mitch. Also, I would like to extend a very, very huge thank you to the Arbor Day success. Thank you to the students, the teachers, city staff, and all the wonderful volunteers who participated in this great event again. I hope some of you can come next year. It was absolutely dynamic. Watching those kids plant those trees and seeing their hearts in it, it was just, it was like magic. And everybody knows magic. Next, Common Council. Comments. Seeing none. Oh, oh, here we go. Alderman Stalbert, you got it. Just right under the button. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I didn't see. I'm still getting up to speed with the consent agenda, so uh, I didn't see anything uh, on this issue. But there was a recent discussion at a planning commission meeting regarding chickens being housed in the city of Marshfield. Um, I do monitor Facebook, but a lot of activity in favor of that. I did receive one call that I thought I would just highlight some of the concerns from a resident, um, maybe for planning commission members or, or consideration. Um, this, uh, and, and I anticipated certain sectors of our population would come forward. This one happens to be a, a retired farmer <clears throat> who uh, lives in Marshfield. And uh, concerns I think could be addressed through, um, um, you know, uh, I wanna say government or, or, or maybe self-control within the organization, but I'll read through them. Uh, routine cleaning of pen and coop requirement. Um, odor of wet chickens, which I wasn't aware of, but you said that wet chickens have a more offensive odor than non-wet chickens. Um, partially digested droppings attracting rodents and other varmints. And disposal of unwanted chickens uh, was a concern. And also some mention about purchasing chickens uh, and one of, one of every three chickens would be a rooster and there was a concern that a rooster would be purchased. So just thought I would air those concerns and uh, leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Russ. And I'll jump in and just invite everyone to come to the plan commission meeting next Tuesday where we will talk about the chickens. So you come, please, please, please join us with the yays or nays or gobbles or I don't know, whatever. Okay, um, next up, city administrators. So, Alderman O'Reilly, and you got under the button too, Alderman O'Reilly. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to just give a little update on the skate park um, work that's gonna be done there. We made it a long way along and I've been meeting with um, Tom and he is putting together a press release for that that should be coming out within about a week or so now. So we've made a lot of ground. And, Looking forward to everybody seeing what's going to be happening there. So just wanted to make everyone aware. Yes, and thank you for that. Alderman Varsho. Um, just more for uh, the common council members. And uh, I had the pleasure today uh, with my father to take a tour of the wastewater facility plant, which I did two years ago. Um, that is probably the biggest gem we have in Marshall that nobody knows about. Uh, it is a, a wonder. It is, a, a, they do such a wonderful job down there. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for, and Mark in the back of the room. Everybody knows, yeah, it's, it's fabulous. Next, I see no yellow. So city administrators <laughs> update. Steve. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, well, just a reminder of the upcoming CIP Capital Improvement Program um, meetings that will be coming up on uh, Thursday, May 18th, and then two weeks later on Thursday, June 1st, 
and both those will be at 6 p.m. here in this room. That'll be a review of the project's discussion uh, leading to ultimately a, a potential approval of a new 2024 to 2028 CIP in late June. I uh, also want to note, and I know we've talked about this before, but it's actually going to happen. Uh, the, uh, I'm going to get a note out to you this week and to members of the EDB. I'll be talking to them about this on Thursday as well. A joint meeting uh, between the city, uh, the council, and the EDB on housing. Uh, and I'll be floating a few dates to both bodies uh, this week. So please be watching for your email if you can and respond about which of those dates work for you uh, to book time and to talk about residential development in the city. Uh, also, just want to talk, touch on something else that came out of a recent Finance, Budget, and Personnel Committee meeting, and that was uh, the idea I threw out there of possibly having a, an early budget meeting, if you will, with the full council, kind of a work session, to talk about uh, the broader issues. I think we always have some real financial challenges. Talk about staffing, to talk about uh, service levels expect, expected, you know, in case we have to make cuts. Just kind of get a broad handle on where we stand today and what some of the issues are that staff is wrestling with as we get ready to begin preparing the department budgets in July and get some direction from the elected officials. So look for an email on that as well. I'm not gonna try and meet, uh, meeting you to death. And I know we're getting into summer and it's actually getting nice outside, but uh, I'm gonna look for a date for a work session. And that could be before a regular council meeting potentially, or it could be a separate night. Just a couple other things real quick. The deadline for facade grant applications, if you're watching this and you're a downtown business owner, our property owner is uh, Friday, May 19th, a week from Friday. We do have monies available if you're looking to fix up your buildings. Um, it's all online. You can check it out on the city's website. And then finally, uh, Jody Gurink and I, the police chief, met uh, last week with Ryan Christensen of Marshfield School District to continue the discussion uh, regarding the possibility of them funding some of the school resource officer uh, program that we have. And it was discussed by their finance committee recently. Uh, they have a different budget cycle than we do. Their, their budget cycle is uh, July 1st to June 30th, where ours is calendar. So, I mean, they're talking about it a little bit off kilter from when they normally would, perhaps. But uh, it does sound from what Ryan is saying, there's support from their finance committee to, uh, to move forward on this as we continue on and look at making a contribution that would be uh, for about 50% of that program for the two officers. We have one in the middle school and one in the high school. So look for more information on that. Their budget cycle will be uh, getting a little bit here later on as we get deeper into 2023. He obviously couldn't promise anything, but there does appear to be support for that notion. Uh, that's all I have to report today. Thank you, Steve, for the update. Item M, reports from commissions, boards, and committees. Seeing none, item N, consent agenda. Motion by Alderman Fire, second by Alderman Tompkins. Any discussion? Alderman Stauber. Thank you, Mayor. Um, again, just procedurally, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'd like to uh, pull out uh, Airport Committee December 15th, Historic Preservation Commission April 3rd, Finance, Budget, and Personnel Committee May 2nd. Yes. Was that the uh, regular or the annual meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission? Uh, regular meeting. Okay. For motion. Uh, without no exceptions, a motion and a second to accept other things other than the three? The, the, the other remaining items. Yes, yeah. the remaining items. Motion by Fires, second by Tompkins. Any other discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. All eyes, thank you. Now, the three items, which first you had made the motion for the airport committee, December 15th. Yes, thank you. And I'm, I'm not tr causing trouble. So I see Mike is over there looking at me. So what's the <laughs> uh, some, sometimes the consent agendas move a little quickly, and I just wanted to highlight a few things and maybe uh, give some food for thought on another. But the airport committee um, submitted uh, four meeting minutes, and uh, in, in usual stellar fashion, they're well done. Uh, but the part that got my attention was Mr. Duffy Geyer was honored by the FAA with the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award for 50 years in aviation during the, the uh, fly-in. Uh, family, friends, and pilots who had uh, flight checks with Duffy were all in attendance to witness. Uh, Duffy had his first flight in 1959, but did not begin training until early 1960s. 
Duffy continued per, pursuing aviation as a hobby and eventually started an aviation business in 1973. From there, he offered flight training and aircraft rental. He later became a designated pilot examiner uh, where people go to him to uh, seek a pilot license. As a designated pilot uh, examiner, we uh, estimate that Duffy had the pleasure of examining over 6,000 pilots for license. And um, I think that's quite admirable for the city of Marshfield. We're lucky to have him. And I just wanted to highlight that uh, recognition by the FAA. So. Um, Otterman Wagner. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, while we're still on the subject of the airport, uh, I'd, I would encourage the council members to take a look uh, at the at the minutes and uh, especially in the last set of minutes and take a look at the, uh, there was a, a picture there of a pickup truck bed full of uh, what looks like tar. That's our runway. Uh, we had a very important meeting out there last, was that Thursday, I believe it was. And uh, we've had a member of the Bureau of Aeronautics come up here. Their repair job they did on the runway, what, two years ago, uh, has just completely failed. And uh, we are trying to talk them into picking up the tab for fixing it. And uh, some of the big commercial jets that come in here uh, may not be able to come in, uh, not to mention what the, what horrible things would happen if, if a lighter single engine plane picked up a piece of that rubber and it's prop, it would be bad. So take a look at it. You'll understand you're, you're quite likely to see some action on this within the next month or two. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that Jeff put these uh, all these things together so you can see the progression of it. So uh, just while we're on that, I'd, I'd just like to make sure you're aware of that. Thank you. And the next one is item H, Historic we, Preservation Commission, regular meeting, we, April 3rd. We should get a motion and a second on that, please. We'll okay, do let's approve them. Oh, do individual? Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'd like a motion and a second to accept. Motion by Alderman Stauber, second by Alderman Varsho. Any other discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. All eyes, thank you. Now, Historic Preservation Commission regular meeting, April 3rd, 2023. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Again, um, nothing bad, just to highlight uh, what I observed during the Historic Preservation Commission meeting, and that was recognition of Mr. Ken Wood uh, from Marshfield. Uh, for those who don't know, Ken was a uh, historian educator, a very humble person. And uh, I couldn't help but think that's, you know, years from now, some grade schooler is gonna pull this book off the library shelf and wonder who Ken Wood was, um, if we still had books back then. But uh, <laughs> I, I thought the, the effort on behalf of the commission to uh, recognize Ken was uh, very honorable. And I just wanted to call them out on that. So thank you. Steve? And just, just to add to that, um, I was at the commission meeting on May 1st and that dialogue continued. They're looking at multiple ways to to give honor and recognition to Mr. Wood. So thank you. Motion by Alderman Wagner, second by Alderman Giles. Any other discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. All ayes, thank you. And our third and final Finance, Budget and Personnel Committee, May 2nd, 2023. I'm going to regret having you back on the council. I talk too much. <laughs> um, so the uh, Finance, Budget, and Personnel Committee of May 2nd, um, I, I would first of all like to commend uh, Alderperson uh, Natasha Tompkins for presenting a, 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 a for consideration travel and, and uh, training. I'm an advocate for uh, training and, and uh, getting staff out to attend conventions. If they have a beer with colleagues from other communities, that's fine too, as long as within city policy. So I, I encourage that. And uh, hopefully we can find a way to um, further support that from a financial perspective. And then the, the next part of that meeting, um, it, it was um, inspiring, I'll say. And uh, as elected officials, we, we operate somewhere between micromanaging and rubber stamping. And I thought that meeting was, you know, a collaborative meeting, good discussion, right in the sweet spot. Staff and, and elected officials had open dialogue and uh, all issues and, and ideas were addressed. Um, then it, it kind of transitioned into, let's figure out a better way to um, well, identify the services that we offer, identify how we deliver those services and at what cost, 
And I would just challenge to, you know, add the idea of um, when times are tight, you know, not only do we look at the services we provided, but perhaps also the assets that we own. Mm -hmm. Why do we own certain things? Why do we do things the way we've done for many years? And put that on the table for consideration as well. So thank you for the Finance Budget and Personnel Committee. Motion by Alderman Giles. Second by Alderman Tompkins. Any other discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. All eyes. Thank you, Alderman Starber, for those three very wonderful things brought out to the meeting. Okay, item P. Right, I can go on to item P yep. because we have the yep. whole taken care of. Right. Approved budget resolution number 16-2023, City Hall Boiler Replacement, presented by Tom Turchi, Public Works. Okay, about three months ago, uh, the, one of our boilers here at City Hall uh, developed a leak, and uh, Jeff Moulter has taken a look at it, and he doesn't believe that it can be repaired with any longevity. Uh, we have a boiler replacement uh, listed in the capital improvement program to replace this boiler in 2024. Uh, what we're asking for with this budget resolution is just to move it one year forward so that we can get it replaced this year. So I'd recommend approval of uh, budget resolution 2000 or 16 2023. Motion on the floor by Alderman Tompkins, second by Alderman Varsho. Any other discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. All eyes, thank you. Request to approve budget resolution number 18-2023, West 8th Street, Greenway Culvert Replacement, presented by Tom Turchi, Director of Public Works. Uh, this is a uh, cleanup of a budget re uh, resolution. Uh, we budgeted uh, $55,000 to replace the culvert at uh, Hawthorne and 8th uh, Street. Um, it'll be a concrete box culvert. Uh, we budgeted the $55,000, which is the uh, amount that is will be expended by the city. The total project cost is $110,000, and the remaining portion is a 50-50 uh, bridge aid project that we got awarded from uh, Wood County. So it's still only costing us $55,000. We were asked to do a budget resolution just to clarify that we're expending $10,000 but getting $55,000 back. So I'd recommend approval of uh, budget resolution 18-2023. Motion by Alderman Stauber, second by Alderman Fire. Any other discussion? Seeing none, please vote. <clears throat> Mrs. Spiros? Yes. All ayes, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Receive overview of 2023 borrowing introduced by Jennifer Solinsky, Finance Director, presented by Dave Ferris Ellers. Good evening. Uh, as we are beginning our annual borrowing process for 2023, um, I would like to introduce Dave Ferris from Ellers, who is our municipal advisor, um, who will be guiding us through uh, the process of issuing our bonds this year. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, thank you for letting me be here to, to introduce this year's borrowing. Um, there should be a document in your in your packet that uh, has the pre-sale report. A pre-sale report really is kind of the document that we get to when we're, we're ready to go to the market. It's kind of encapsulated all the things that you've done in the last year. We actually started last May with a couple of meetings on the capital plan. You actually approved the projects that are, are being requested to be funded with the bonds last fall. I think there's been a couple of tweaks uh, since then, but they're, they're basically it's the same, uh, same uh, project listing that you approved last fall during the budget process. Uh, when you look at the agenda, you can see there's a lot of uh, agenda items that go along with this. And one of the reasons that is, is because in the state of Wisconsin, you have to approve each purpose uh, that is, is listed. And there are specific purposes that bonds can be used for. So in the case of this, you have, you have everything that, that actually, if you looked at the, the list on page six, that shows how your projects, you can see the purposes that are listed there. There should be eight purposes that are listed there, and you can see the amounts in each one of those resolutions that it basically uh, covers that. Um, the other thing that is in there is something called the notice to electors. 
uh, that's something that has to be published in the paper that basically gives the public a chance to, uh, you know, if they don't like one of your projects, they can actually have 30 days where they have to get a certain amount of signatures. It has to do with a, a percentage of the, the uh, governor's election the last time. And, and if, if they got enough signatures, they could maybe block one of the purposes if they had to, but you have to go through that 30 day period. And that's why our sale is actually after 30 days from today. Uh, and the last resolution is actually the entire issue. So it'll be the amount that you see on the cover of the pre-sale report of $3,650,000. Uh, going through the report, just kind of highlighting it. I, I was told I only get 10 minutes, but I don't have a PowerPoint. So I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit better off on that one. Somebody approached me early on and told me I had to get done fast. Um, plus you had a long meeting already. Uh, so we, we are actually taking a, uh, going to the market with 3650000 to cover those projects that are on page six. Uh, the one item in the authority section on page one of the, the summary that I want to point out is that we always talk at financial management plan presentation time about debt capacity. Uh, after this borrowing, you'll have about $45 million of debt outstanding, which is 43% of your statutory amount. The statutory amount that you can borrow is 5% of your taxable property in the city. So, uh, you know, anything that can be taxed, that that amount is how much you can you can borrow 5% of. So that gives you about um, a capacity left after that of about $60 million. So you have quite a bit left. You're under your policy of 65%. Uh, you have plenty of room to keep doing your projects in the future. Uh, as far as the next section, the, this bond, we're only taking out 15 years. It, we didn't find that we needed to take this out 20 years. We could fit this in in 15 years. Um, you're able to call this bond in March 1st of 2032 for anything that is maturities of 2033 through 2038, if it makes good sense, or if you maybe you have a cash windfall that you're able to pay anything off early. So you have the ability to pay off uh, some of those later maturities at that point. Going on to the next page, page two, we're gonna have a call with Moody's on May 31st, which is the rating agency. Steve and Jennifer will sit in with myself and the analyst for Moody's. And uh, as some of you may or may not know, uh, the city did actually get upgraded from a A1 to a AA3 this last spring, uh, We had, or maybe it was fall. It seemed like it was yesterday. Um, so I, I think it's something that we're really proud that we were actually able to show Moody's that we our, our financials look good and that we have something that they think is worthy of upgrading your credit. And we wanna make sure we maintain that. So that, that conference call will be something where we're really gonna to try to toot our horn about where our financials have gone. Uh, I think we'll have, will we have the audit by then? Okay, so I'll have a preliminary audit. Hopefully those numbers will show that we're continuing to improve um, and make them happy so that they, they affirm that AA3 again. Uh, we're gonna sell this issue competitively, meaning that we will offer it to local, regional, and national underwriters. Uh, the more bids we get, the better off the interest rate is. And I think we usually have a, a no problem getting the three that is a minimum, minimum amount that we'd like to see. Um, I think we have a decent size issue. We'll get uh, hopefully, you know, somewhere between three and six uh, bids on this. Let's see, on page, no, I think we'll go on to page four. Top of page four, we actually had a call with uh, staff last week about investment of of either bond proceeds or potentially general fund monies. Uh, there, you know, the, the state pool has a decent interest rate, but we have suggestions as an advisor of possibilities of ways that you can make more than the pool. And so I think staff will be looking at that and, and maybe bringing something forward to discuss for the council. As far as the other service providers, uh, Corals and Brady does your bond council and disclosure council. Disclosure Council really looks at the document that the underwriters use to bid on your bonds. It's called the official statement. They make sure that that thing is accurate and complete. Um, let's see. Next page, we have the calendar of events. I'm here today to talk to you about this pre-sale report and what, what the bond issue is about. Uh, that call with uh, Quarles and Brady about the official statement will be the week of June 5th, maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, the official statement will go out right after that. Uh, we actually have the rating uh, call scheduled for May 31st, so that's actually moved up a little bit. Uh, we'll be back here on June 13th, hopefully at the beginning of the six o'clock hour. <laughs> um, 
to talk about how the sale process or how the sale went, and then uh, we'll, you'll get your money on June 29th, which, which you can start to either uh, pay for your projects or if you've paid some monies out already, that you'll be able to reimburse those with the proceeds. Just to kind of just jump through the schedules real quick, I talked about the, the schedule of projects on page six. So you can see what makes up. Uh, the bond issue, the ones that say notes are something that I think Jennifer will bring forward either with a state trust fund loan or a bank loan. Uh, so you'll see that. I think uh, the uh, boiler was one of the things that we got, got added to that list. Um, the next page is how we size an issue. So you can see a summary by really the, the funds that are going to borrow the money, which is the $3,555,000 that should match up to this, the previous uh, pages list of things. Uh, the the estimated uh, issuance costs are some things are based on the size of the issues. Some are actually bid items on the day of the the sale, which would be like the underwriter. Um, the sometimes I think we've got solid numbers on the advisors and the bond council and disclosure council. So mainly it'll be the underwriter fees that they'll lower that fee to actually get your get your uh, bonds to be able to to sell to their investors. There's a little bit of interest earnings while we hold the monies and, and do the project, and then we do, we issue bonds in increments of five thousand, so we have to round up to that number uh, so that we can have a five thousand dollar increment. The next page is how we determine the interest or the uh, tax levy uh, when we were going through the financial management plan and we were trying to figure out how we're going to fit the five years of projects in. We kind of zeroed in on an amount that was going to be about five million a year for a tax levy. We're actually a little bit better than that. Uh, we're coming in at about four point seven million. Some of that is because we shortened up the issue. Uh, some of that is just um, uh, you know we didn't. We didn't really need to go up to the five million. We feel like that it's a better that if that's our number that we would actually go up to that, depending on your project list in the future years, that would step up to that five million if that really ends up being the number when we're doing the financial management plan update this year. So it's something we can explore further, but we did lower the amount of the levy as opposed to what we showed you at the at the presentation a few months ago. Um, let's see. As far as that pink column, that is the proposed structure of the new debt. On the next two pages is really the breakout by those purposes that you're seeing in your in your list of uh, of uh, resolutions that you pass for the purposes. So you can see how each one of those be paid. We've broken out by the number of years as well, uh, just so that Jennifer can match up better the the useful lives of those assets to the repayment. And then the next page, as we talked about with the debt capacity, this is a graph of just this issue. Your policy is 65% of your statutory um, uh, debt limit. Your that, so that blue line is the statutory line. The red line is your policy. And the green line is really where you're at with just what the existing debt is plus this one. So you're at about 50% at the end of 22 per the audit. And then you, we actually go down from that, even though we're issuing new debt. And then that kind of keeps going down. You know, you're going to fill those holes in as you borrow debt in the future, um, and it probably end up being more of a flat line if if you uh, stick to the plan that you have now. I've also included just an interest rate graph to show things. You know, a year ago everything kept going up, up, and up, and you know, right now we're kind of in a, a, a position where the rates are somewhat similar to um, the end of. Uh, well, actually, probably last May, they're not too far off from that. Uh, so we're kind of in the same interest rate market as we were a year ago. The 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 actual the actual uh, uh, what do you want to call it? The line graph of the interest rates is more flat this year. Uh, the the for the maturities in the beginning are a lot higher than they were a year ago, but uh, the back end is kind of stayed in the same spot. So it's flattened out quite a bit. Um, but I think uh, we're in a decent, we've had a bunch of months or a bunch of weeks where we've actually had some drops in the rates. Let's hope that we don't have anything like uh, defaulting on our debt cause interest rates go, go nuts. Um, uh, it's hard to say, but at this point, it has not been a crazy year like it was last year where things just kept going up. So that's kind of a, a summary of what the borrowing's about. I'm happy to answer any questions. Alderman Stauber. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my questions aren't really specific to the uh, items, but uh, 
could you could you tell us exactly or you know what kind of triggers the the positive change in a Moody's rating for a city like Marshville? What do we do right? So uh, the history of of basically Ellers being involved with your municipal advising, we walked in and found that there were some things that um, definitely made an impact on where your health was. And so from that, you were actually downgraded from a double A3 to an A1, and then subsequently actually given an outlook, outlook, which doesn't happen very often. So we were at a negative outlook a year ago, Steve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So not only did we, uh, when we went to, I think, borrow last fall, we, we were able to knock off the outlook to be just an A1, but then Moody's changed their uh, methodology and took a look at the entire city, including the utilities. And I don't know if you've uh, taken a look at the electric utility or had a, a, a presentation, but they definitely have very strong uh, financial marks and that I think helps the city as well. But we have also improved our liquidity and some of our debt uh, standing as far as the way that the city looks on its own. So I think it's been a combination of things uh, the TIF districts are starting to become healthy and pay off their advances. In fact, that they should be paid off very soon. And that's great because advances are something that make rating agencies just go, you know, they don't like them. So we're almost out of having to, to prop up the TIF districts with cash. Um, and that that cash being paid back by the, or the TIF districts actually puts more cash into the general fund's hands, which is a good thing because it shows liquidity and gives you flexibility to pay your bills. Okay, thank you. And uh, a follow-up question if I could. Um, so in your line of work, you, you see a lot of communities. How would you compare Marshfield uh, to other communities our size, whether they stand alone or, or adjacent to other communities, just kind of at a high level? Well, I would say, you know, every, every municipality is different based on the services you provide. Um, it's not really easy to say that I know somebody that's just like you, but I would say the one thing that I know about the city is that the city has been very focused on becoming healthy again. And, and it's been really something to go from basically bottoming out about three or four years ago to watch how things have, have happened, including at the council meeting last fall when we had to actually cut some costs. Uh, levy limits have been tough. You guys have actually done something about it. A lot of communities, anytime you talk about cutting services or cutting costs, they don't do it. They, they just talk about it and then they end up deficit spending. I think the city is taking steps to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and hopefully the state will come through with this budget uh, with an increase in, in revenues through the, the sales tax. And then hopefully after that's in place that maybe we can get the levy limit worksheet fixed so that there's some kind of a CPI uh, ability to raise your your taxes to pay for your services. Anyone else, any questions? Again, thank you, Dave. Thanks. That was for information only. Request to approve initial resolution number 2023-22 authorizing $40,000 general obligation bonds for the construction of police facilities. Motion by Alderman Wagner, second by Alderman Varshow. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. Motion passes. Request to approve initial resolution number 2023-23, authorizing 85,000 general obligation bonds for equipment for the fire department. Motion by Alderman Fire, second by Alderman Tompkins. Any other discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. Motion passes. Request to approve initial resolution number 2023-24, authorizing 40,000 general obligation bonds for fire station projects. Motion by Alderman Varsho, second by Alderman Bridal. Any other discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. 
That motion passes. Request to approve initial resolution number 2023-25 authorizing $3,095,000 general obligation bonds for street improvement projects. Motion by Alderman Tompkins, second by Alderman O'Reilly, and Alderman Wagner has a comment question. Yeah, I, I wanted to, uh, for those of you who have been on the council for a while, you'll notice that this format's a lot different than what we've been doing. We used to vote on one, you know, one big bond issue, and basically we're both voting on the elements of the bond issues here, and they're also separated by by the, uh, the, the type of, of improvement they are. Uh, I really like this. I think this is going to add a, a, a sense of accountability. We can know exactly where we are on, on what projects we've had. And I want to compliment uh, Eilers and, and the, the finance department for do, putting this particular thing together. It's excellent. Any other comments? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. Motion passes. Request to approve initial resolution number 2023-26, authorizing 55,000 general obligation bonds for sewer projects. Motion by Alderman Tompkins, second by Alderman Stauber. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. Motion passes. Item X. Request to approve initial resolution number 2023-27, authorizing 205,000 general obligation bonds for parks and public grounds projects. Motion by Alderman O'Reilly, second by Alderman Varsho. Any other discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. Yeah. Motion passes. Request to approve initial resolution number 2023-28, authorizing 110,000 general obligation bonds for UW System College campuses. Motion by Alderman Giles, second by Alderman Stauber. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yep. Motion passes. Item Z, request to approve initial resolution number 2023-29, authorizing $20,000 general obligation bonds for airport projects. Motion by Alderman Fire, second by Alderman Tompkins. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. Motion passes. Double A, request to approve initial resolution number 2023-30, directing publication of notice to electors relating to bond issues. Motion by Alderman Varshow, second by Alderman O'Reilly. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Sparrows? Yes. Motion carries. Item BB, request to approve initial resolution number 2023-31, providing for the sale of not to exceed 3,650,000 general obligation corporate purpose bonds, series 2023-A. Motion by Alderman Wagner, second by Alderman Ragel. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Sparrows? Yep. <laughs> Motion passes. Item CC, request to approve resolution number 2023-32, designating official authorities to declare office intent under reimbursement bond. Yes, sir. I, just, I think she wants to speak to this one. I'm sorry. I didn't oh, she, you. Yeah, she's up. Yes, sir. Okay. She's up on this one. Okay. Yes, sir. Yep. Reimbursement bond resolution presented by Jennifer Solinsky, finance director. Yep, yep. Okay, so as part of our borrowing, um, the process that we go through is we approve the CIP, we put it in the budget, and then we turn the calendar year and we start spending. Um, as part of council, there's a treasury reg regulation out there that if you anticipate that you will spend before your proceeds, that you should pass a resolution authorizing individuals in the organization to declare an intent to seek reimbursement for those expenditures that happened prior to receiving your bond proceeds. Um, we did have this resolution historically, um, but it, it got changed with a, a separate borrowing. So I'm bringing it back in its general sense 
um, whereby this resolution would authorize either the city administrator or the finance director to go ahead and make that official declaration that the city intends to reimburse itself with future proceeds. So with that, I would ask um, approval of resolution 2023-32. Motion by Alderman Giles, second by Alderman Varshall. Any uh, discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Oh, um, item DD, request to approve final resolution number 2023-19, project 312297, Millen Place and Asphalt Overlay Projects presented by Tom Turchie, Director of Public Works. All right, we had a public hearing on these projects tonight. Uh, it was Antone Avenue, 5th Street to 4th Street. Uh, Becker Road, Maple Avenue to Daggy Street, Edison Street from Cedar Avenue to Becker Road, Lincoln Avenue from 14th Street to a half mile south, um, Vine Avenue from Becker Road to Edison Street, 5th Street, Hume Avenue to Anton Avenue, A Street from Peach Avenue to Felker Avenue, um, St. Joseph's Avenue, Arnold Street to the asphalt going north 1,970 feet, uh, Lemley Avenue from 21st to 5th Street, Northridge Street from Hamas Drive to Central Avenue and 5th Street, Anton Avenue to Lemley. These are our mill in place projects and this is the final resolution for special assessments that goes with the, these projects. Motion by Alderman O'Reilly, second by Alderman Tompkins. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. <clears throat> Mrs. Spiros? Yes. Mr. Fire, I assume you're a yes. Motion passes. Item EE, request to approve final resolution number 2023-20, project 312344, street construction, water service laterals, and storm sewer projects, and project 351755, sanitary sewer, Service laterals presented by Tom Turchie, Director of Public Works. Uh, this is for the Arnold Street project from St. Joseph's Avenue to 700 feet west uh, for the total reconstruction. And this is the final resolution to go with the estimated special assessments that goes with that project. Motion by Alderman Tompkins, second by Alderman Stauber. Any other discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mr. Stauber. Mrs. Spiros? Yes. Item FF, request to approve final resolution number 2023-21, project 351756, sanitary sewer service laterals presented by Tom Turchie, Director of Public Works. Uh, these projects are for locations where we're replacing sanitary sewer main and we'll be affecting people's sanitary sewer service laterals. Uh, Cherry Avenue from 2nd Street to 1st Street, Chestnut Avenue, Depot Street to Blodgett Street, Depot Street, Chestnut Avenue to Central Avenue, Palmetto Avenue from Daggy Street to Becker Road, and A Street from Felker Avenue to 175 feet west of Felker Avenue. I'd recommend approval of uh, Resolution 2023-21. 20, we have a motion on the floor by Alderman Bar uh, Fire, second by Alderman Varshall. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Mrs. Okay. Spiros? Yes. Uh, item GG, first reading of ordinance number 1493, prohibiting the dumping of garbage, presented by Harold Wolfram, city attorney. Uh, you have a draft of that ordinance or a format for the ordinance. Um, this really came as a result of an issue that was brought to me by ordinance officers. They had several complaints for um, local businesses where things were being dumped in dumpsters and that sort of thing. And while it was garbage or recyclables, um, it was a burden and uh, a problem for those businesses. And the, well, there may be an argument that under the previous uh, provisions in our code, we could cite that under certain circumstances, this makes clear that it's not appropriate to dump garbage in somebody else's dumpster or on their property. There were some occasions where it was, you know, a, a bag of trash left alongside an area where garbage is otherwise kept. So um, this clarifies that and that was the purpose the ordinance was prepared. 
Thank you, no action taken. This is the first reading, it'll be adopted set for May 23rd. And final, HH, report on Eller's public finance seminar requested by Alderman Tompkins, presented by Michael Riley, Alderperson District 9. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I requested Steve send that information out because three months into this, <laughs> I don't have a lot of usable information to come back with. Um, I think some of the highlights for me were seeing some of the TIF districts that they did. West Bend comes to mind. They had a amazing transformation of their downtown. Um, and a lot of it was focused on the back of buildings and with the river running through it, it just really transformed that area. Um, to be honest with you, I kind of went through the stuff again and I, I wish I had more usable information. Had I done it earlier, I guess I'm thinking I would have had more, but the, the packet that was sent to each of you breaks down each of the different seminars. So if you had any specific questions in there, maybe I'll to jog my memory, but I apologize after three months, I, I don't hold that stuff up there that long. So um, <laughs> other than that, I, uh, I'm, I, don't, I don't think I'm gonna be much used to get into it, but thanks. Alderman Tompkins, you have a comment? I do, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this handout was excellent. So thank you for, um, I think because you went to the conference, we got the handout, so that was great. Um, there is two really excellent presentations that I would love to have the finance department do as an education seminar for us, if ever possible. Um, the one is on, um, it's the financing one, and it basically goes through terms that we're gonna be using during the budget process. And um, just explaining like how you could hold money in different accounts with different, it's, it was just excellent. And I feel like at the whole council, if we had Jennifer or Jordan walk us through those slides that um, we'd be on the same page. We'd know what people are talking about. And then the other one was the TIF financing, which um, that would be a great, another great hour presentation, just using those slides, just so again, we're on the same, mm -hmm. understand. Um, what these are and how they work. So I don't know if that's possible to do, but it would definitely be worth it. Thank you. And thank you, Meg, for stepping up and going. And give yourself a little more credit, right, everybody? Obviously, as Natasha said, great reports. And item II, guess what? Would somebody please make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Rebecca, motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Alderman O'Reilly, all those in favor? Opposed? And thank you very much. There we go. Perfect.